Welcome everyone. Uh, it is 3.15. It's time to start the presentation. Uh, my name is John Franklin. I am a senior systems engineer at a company called Bixel. Maybe you've heard of us. Um, we've had a number of presentations here and a lot of them have been absolutely fantastic. So I've got a, I've got a high bar to, to cross here. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about login.gov and how we've been integrating it with a couple of the sites that we've built for some federal clients. Uh, it's going to start with what is login.gov? Uh, it is a, it's an identity provider, uh, is the technical term, uh, the single sign-on service. Uh, it is, they maintain a database of user accounts uh, with the logins and passwords and do some identity proofing to make sure that these people are who they claim to be. Uh, and then they make it possible for you to outsource the authentication for your own website. It's a lot like, if you've ever done the uh, login with GitHub or a login with Microsoft on, on some site. It's like that. I mean, it's almost exactly that, but built for government. Uh, it was started in 2016 uh, by 18F, and uh, I think USGS was also, uh, USDS, USGS is different, USDS, the uh, digital service. Um, they launched it in August of 2017 about a year and a half after they started it. And by August of 2019, there's a blog post on the same site down there you see quoting from, saying that they had 15 million users already on the site. So for two years, and barely any sites that are really using it, that's not a bad uptake. That, that's, that was a pretty good adoption. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we see a lot more of login.gov. Uh, because it really is built to be, you log in once, you have one set of credentials, and it applies to anything across the federal government that, uh, that you need to log into, whether it's dealing with some tax thing, or checking student loans, or applying for FEMA aid, or whatever it is. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, well, first of all, what is a single sign-on service? Uh, it is a centralized identity and authentication platform. It is some place where they take care of the authentication, they take care of the password policy, they take care of uh, making sure you've updated passwords in, in a timely manner. Uh, Kerberos, SAML, OIDC, those are examples of it. And it differs from a common sign-on in that the common sign-on is just a database of users and, and passwords. But with a single sign-on, the authentication happens at that central location. And with a common sign-on, like just a database, I mean, it's like if you exported out your users table in Drupal and let any other site use it, those other sites are still going to be setting up their own password pages or their log login pages, and the authentication happens at that site rather than on the, the common uh, on the single sign-on platform. Um, so let's do a quick demo of it. Let's see just how easy it is to use this. I've got a nice little. Test site to see your setup with a login page. Very, very dapper looking site, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Click login with login.gov and you're logged in. Really, it's that simple. Okay, granted, this is the really, really simple edition of it. This is the I've already set up an account on login.gov, I've already connected it to this site, and I'm already logged in to the login.gov platform. So that you know, when you hit log, login to login.gov, you get kicked over to there. It says, oh, I know you already. Go on back. And boom, you're, you're already in. So let's take a look at it if you're not yet logged in. It's a little bit different. So um, this here is reload this because it's in the identity sandbox. Everyone is named Fakey. So let's say I'm not logged into login.gov right now and I try to go in. Now it's going to say, my site name, whatever friendly name I registered with login.gov, is trying to use login.gov to allow you to sign into your account safely and securely. So use your favorite password manager. In this case, I've got two-factor set up with my, with my UV key. Use security key. What's the pin for it? And that's it. It it makes logging in as a user 
way easier. And if you're not yet connected to the site, then it will allow you to connect and create a new account automatically. So you don't even have to really worry about the provisioning process of creating. I mean, your Drupal is still going to be creating a matching account on your site, but for the users, it can be a lot, a lot easier. So again, let's make sure that I'm logged out here. So when I try to log back in, this time I'm going to use my, my PIV card. And down here at the bottom, there's a little hidden link that says sign in with your government employee ID. What you can't see is that it's asking for my PIN here on the laptop screen. Say OK. Did it get it? Confirm current password to continue. And because I haven't connected to the site before with this particular PIV card, um, it's saying, hey, Drupal, Drupal test wants a bunch of information that we have in order to build out your profile, to, to preset it. And are you happy with giving all of this information? Maybe, maybe not. You know, the one thing I don't like about the whole thing, and this is not a thing about just login.gov, this is identity platforms and privacy stuff across the industry. I can't say this is okay and this is not. It's all or nothing. It's I have to use this, so that means I have to give you everything. And say yes, and you're just logged in. It makes things a lot easier. So it looks easy back there. What's actually going on behind the scenes? Is this going to work? Yes, there it is. So user clicks a login with login.gov, and then they are redirected to login.gov with a, it's called a state token. It's basically just, it's kind of like a cookie, but different. And login.gov then says, OK, let's authenticate you. In the first case, I was already authenticated, so it just kind of bypassed that. Later on, you actually have to authenticate yourself. If you've never been to login.gov before, then you have to actually create an account on login.gov and prove your identity, which is a little bit of a pain uh, because they do you put in your cell phone number and they ask you to send a photo of like your driver's license front and back so that they can have some kind of a proof of identity on record for you. For the sandbox site that we're looking at, they say don't send that in and they don't actually do anything to check it. I sent the front and back of my favorite coffee mug and that worked fine. Um, once you've actually set up the account, if you need to log into login.gov, you're redirected back with that state code that came in in step two and a new auth code, which your website then uses to directly ask login.gov, hey, tell me about this guy. What's his uh, name? What's his phone number? What's his social security number? Is he dreamy? And uh, if the auth code checks out, then login.gov sends back some data. What you might notice here is that everything is going outward to login.gov. So if you are trying to do some development testing and you just have a system on your local VM, on your machine that's behind that, that's completely inaccessible to anything that is not your laptop, it'll still work. Because all the connections are going from your laptop, from the website, or from the user's browser, which is, when you're doing development, you, out to login.gov. There's no connections coming back. So let's talk about a little bit about how this works in practice. There's some setup that we need to do on both the Drupal side and on the login.gov side. Um, on login.gov, you start by going to developers.login.gov. And they've got a whole bunch of documentation there uh, that explains what you need to do. The big thing that you need before you start is you have to have a federal agency email address. Uh, because they, that's 
just the requirement that they have because they know they're going to be doing this login stuff for federal agencies and that was just like the easiest way to make sure that it's actually a federal agency they're talking to. Um, on the Drupal side, Composer required Drupal slash login.gov uh, because there is a module that we put together that just takes care of it. Let me see if I'm... There is a patch that you need to make sure that you include in your patches in uh, Composer JSON, but it's one line, you copy and paste that in, and Bob's your uncle. It really is, it's really simple. So on the login.gov side, it's probably where you want to start looking. And let's take a look at that live. Oh, I'm gonna have to re-log in here real quick. Sign out as that fakey, sign in as the other one. When you set up a, in, they call it an application, um, because everything on the, it's a web application apparently is what everyone is creating, and that's that's a fine terminology for it. Um, here I, we created Drupal test, that's the one that we've been seeing in, in the demos, and we'll go down to just hit edit because this is the same form that you're going to see when you actually create it. Is it a production site or not? And you, know, you start with no. Um, name of the inner of the thing as it appears in the internet agency agreement. When you set up the production, the sandbox site, you don't need that because you haven't got the internet agency agreement yet. And honestly, that IAA, talk to your program manager who's going to talk to the core, who's going to talk to whoever the IAA person is at the agency and get that started. It can take 60 days for that to get in. Uh, so you want to get those talks started early. Give it a friendly name. Whatever name you put here, remember it said Drupal test is trying to log you in with login.gov. Whatever you put there shows up. Set the team. For the module that we have, the OpenID Connect JWT is what we support, so that's what you want to choose there. And then everything else is just, what do you want to know about the, the user? What's important about it? And then remember this string here, because we're going to need that when we configure on the Drupal side. Uh, you all also need to create a SSL certificate and upload the public part of it. The sort of, when you create an SSL certificate, you create a private key, which is used for uh, signing stuff and, and encrypting stuff on your, on the, your end, and then the cert, which allows them to decrypt whatever you sign with that private key. Basic public private key uh, asymmetric encryption. You just need to upload the private side, and then we're going to be putting the public. The, Put the, I'm sorry, put the public side up here and then save the private side. We're going to be putting that into the Drupal side in a bit. Down here, the redirect URLs. Put in, you can put in as many as you like. You can make it Londo.site things. You can make it local VMs. You can make it, it doesn't matter. But only sites that report that as a redirect URL will be will be able to actually use uh, login under your application name. And that URL is what in step four in that thing we show we were looking at earlier. Uh, when the user gets redirected back to login.gov, that's the URL that it's going to be going to. When we set up the the module, at the very bottom it's going to say use this for the redirect URL, put this up in the in that application and you'll be so good to go. And then just make sure it's turned on. They also allow for some uh, custom help text. And that's it. I mean, this is, there's a bit here, but it's not hard. There, there's really nothing complex or, or you know, nothing that you're going to have to really go and investigate stuff before you can set it up. So that's the side that's on login.gov. 
Now let's take a look at the, the module itself and how it gets configured. Going back here, I'm going to log out, get back in as the other account that I have. Configuration for it is under People OpenID Connect. It is a plugin for the OpenID Connect module. Uh, and when you install login.gov, it's going to pull in OpenID Connect as a dependency along with a couple other things. Um, and then you just go hit plus, you know, add a login.gov line here. We have it already set up. Give it a name. Remember that string I said to remember? Copy paste it into here. Make sure you're set to sandbox mode at first. And then decide what level of authentication do you need? Do you need to have uh, just basic or do you need verified identity? A verified identity means that someone's actually like uploaded their um, <coughs> their credit, their net credit card, their driver's license or their PIV card or something like that to be a, a proof of identity that login.gov maintains. And then do they need to have uh, multi-factor authentication turn on. And if you've got this part here that you can say, require that it, they use a PIV card. And those PIV cards are basically just SSL certs. Uh, and so it's really saying, when we get a connection in, make sure that the X509 presented field is, is set. Decide what data you want, that you want to ask for. And then the key module is what we're using in order to maintain that, uh, that secret. Uh, and does that jump me over to, yeah. Do you need to go over into the keys section under configuration system keys, add a private key. Do it this way, so it's authentication type, private key. And then they got three ways of doing that either through configuration where you just paste it in here, through an environment variable that gets uh, set up in your hosting environment, or a file that's somewhere on the file system. And we're doing this with the module because this is a much better way. They've got a whole system set up for maintaining uh, secrets. There may actually be some plugins for this here as well that could support like uh, AWS Secrets Manager or something like that. But again, you know, there's like half dozen things, dozen things that you need to put in here. And once you've got this set up, once you've got the stuff on login.gov set up, you, know, you copy the redirect URL here back into uh, the login.gov application, you're done. Federation just works. It's people just click you know, login with login.gov and, and they're in. So it's easy on the users, it's easy on you guys it's a, uh, and it's good for, you know, the citizenry at large who are trying to use a lot of different government services. So if you can get this set up on yours, absolutely do it. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. Because there's, you know, every time you start dealing with something like authentication, they're always going to be asking about the security questions. Uh, you'll be able to inherit a handful of AC controls, of course. But they've also got this set up as a, you know, zero trust architecture enabled sort of thing. Only the registered URLs that you have on that redirect are going to be able to use your account in order to log in. Um, we sign on the Drupal side. They're called JW, JSON web tokens. They're just little bits of JSON that we push up to say, hey, this is what we're asking for and, and get some data back. That private key that we created, we use that to sign and say, hey, yeah, no, this is really us. And they use the public cert that we upload to login.gov <coughs> to verify that that's the case. On the other way, login.gov signs data with their private key as well, which they have published up on their site. 
and the module just automatically grabs the latest cert and, and checks it. So we sign to them, they sign to us. Only the URLs that um, we put into login.gov can be used to log in. There's some pretty strong zero trust authenticating each side uh, that, that's going on here. When you're doing some debugging, I highly recommend the GitHub thing here and it, um, in the notes of the presentation, there's the Chrome and the Firefox Mozilla add-on store. Um, the SAML OIDC tracer, it's kind of like you're know, looking at the network view on the developer tools, but it specifically decodes a lot of the parameters and tells you what is being passed back and forth. So you can use that to figure out how far is the connection getting before something is going wrong. Um, I found this to be really, really valuable in, uh, when working with the first site that we put together for Ed. Here's the catch. Odds are you want to be using this module in order to use login.gov. And the reason for that is not anything about the module or anything about Drupal. It is entirely about the way that government is structured. Um, agencies build out their own identity providers internally. Everyone's got you know, some way of putting in your PIV cards and authenticating that, and they are running their own internal Active Directory or something like that in order to uh, authenticate these. And so when you are setting this up, they really would rather you just use that if you can. So you're probably going to be, for purely internal sites, using their internal PIV cards. Um, for sites that have mixed use, some internal, some external, they're going to set up a proxy IDP, a proxy identity provider that your site will connect to. And then that proxy IDP will say, are you an internal or external user? Are you, are you a part of the agency or not? And if you are, then kick you over to Active Directory. If not, then we'll kick you over to login.gov. Literally, it acts as an identity provider to uh, your website, but from the website out, it basically turns around and says, hey, I'm a service provider. I need to connect to another identity provider, get that data, and then feed it back. By doing that, they can cache the logins, uh, so you don't have to have nearly as many round trips. They can reduce the fees paid to GSA because login.gov, for all its wonderfulness, is a cost recovery operation. That's just the way that it's structured in, in government. And that means that all the agencies have to pay fees to the GSA for its use. And the more people log in, I, I think it is actually a pay per authentication event. And it's like a penny, but they add up. So uh, if they can cache logins, if they can redirect people to their own internal thing, they can reduce the fees paid to the GSA. And you remember that interagency agreement that I mentioned earlier on? They have to have every website that is going to be using it listed in that interagency agreement. So every time they add a new site, they have to amend it. Every time a site goes away, they have to amend it. And managing that interagency agreement is burdensome. So if they can have just one, their own internal SSO.agency.gov or, SSO or login.agency.gov doing it, then that simplifies things considerably. I can't say that you know, they're wrong, but it does mean that when you connect to a site, you're probably going to have to click one more step. You're going to have to say log in and then say, I'm going to log in as a private citizen or I'm going to log in as a uh, agency user and then go through the rest of the login process. It's a little more cumbersome, but still better than having a million passwords. So that's it. Um, key takeaways. Login.gov provides SSO across all of government, permitting, you know, as, and grows as, you know, adoption starts to grow. Um, it's good for you guys because it's easy to set up. You don't have to worry about telling people to change their passwords every 60 days. You don't have to worry about setting up a whole, bu a whole bunch of code that matches the password policy for the agency, which having done that, um, 
And it's good for users because you know the the users don't have to set up new passwords and logins for every single website that the federal government makes. And you guys all know the government loves them their websites. So with that, uh, it's all quick and easy, and it's easy for you. It's easy for them. It's easy, easy, easy. Are we Drew? Oh, Mike and Ella were here because he would say it's Drupal easy. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, before I was with my team, they looked into this and they deemed it was too expensive for their need. Has it come down in pricing in the last couple of years? No idea. <laughs> I don't deal with the money. Um, how does this work uh, in conjunction with the Drupal user account management system and that the, the identity system within Drupal? Like, does this login like supersede the Drupal if you have it installed? Does it work alongside the Drupal login? It can work alongside. Um, it's literally creating an account. As soon as you log in with login.gov and then come back to the site, it's creating a Drupal account. Uh, and actually, let's I can show you the people page here. If you don't have some kind of a hook, blah, 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 to do it, that's the default username that it gets. OIDC underscore whatever the machine name of uh, the connector is underscore whatever the hash is. Uh, and it remembers that it's connected to a particular site. Uh, the nice thing about this is if you have multiple email addresses and you only allow certain email addresses to be used, like we had with um, one site that we built, you had to have either a internal agency email address or one from one of these state, federal, uh, state governments. And so we had to validate that. And then as you came in, we had to say, you're a federal user, you're a state user. And they got treated slightly differently because they were doing different things in some workflow. Uh, but once we, you had logged in with your state government one, if you happen to log in with your personal email address, as long as they were both, let me bring it back up here. As long as it's one of the email addresses here, because you're already married up using that account ID here, you still get logged in. It's only that first time that you need to use the state one. Uh, so yeah, it works alongside. And I think you can even say this guy. Maybe it's the simple sample one. If you have uh, passwords turned on and there's a password here for them, yeah, yeah it, it works alongside. Uh, we've got passwords turned off on this particular one and there's a nice module called no rec new pass that turns off the, I forgot my password thing, I would let them generate a, a URI to just get in. But here's the thing, those URIs are still general, you can still make them with Drush and so you can still log in as anyone just by saying Drush URI minus my CURID blah blah blah. In the back. So the only data that is passing from login.go back to Google is the email address. And then once it creates an account with that email address, um, it's not going to keep creating an account for the same email login. Like, there's no way to get that other data that they're submitting to login.go. Uh, actually, no. We do. It does send it to you. Uh, when we bring the presentation back up. In that fifth step there, where your web server sends a connection to directly to login.gov saying, hey, I've got this auth code. Tell me about them. I'm, I would like to know long list of stuff. And it puts it all into a JSON thing and, and sends it back. Uh, you can write some hook pre-auth and hook, a bunch of hooks and, and events that you can uh, subscribe to and take all that data and, and use that to pre-populate the profile for a user. So like uh, Drupal can get their social security number? If you ask for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a process, right? Like, it's not that you're going to ask for the security number just like that. Like. No, you have to, yeah, it's, it is something that you have to set up. Let me, 
in setting up the, account, the connector here, it's one of the fields that you can ask for. Somewhere in there. So likely there are sites across the federal government that store social security numbers that they got from logging.gov? Potentially, yes. But if you remember, there was that one page that said, hey, uh, Drupal test wants to know all this about you. One of the fields there was social security number. So it'll, yeah. you'll know when that's happening. Uh, and for the most part, sites don't want that because that's PII and, and radioactive. Yeah, it says, are we reporting it not unknowingly? Yes. <laughs> is this extensible, though? I mean, there could be additional fields that we might want that aren't so sensitive that could be useful. Um, those are the ones that they offer. Okay. So will login.gov you know, enhance the product and add more? Maybe, maybe not. You can always add more profile stuff in your own site yeah. and just you know, have users put stuff in there. Uh, that there was the option for SAML. Um, is OAuth now their preferred uh, provider? OIDC, when you go onto the thing, it says OIDC is the preferred way of doing it. Uh, but yeah, they do support SAML if you want to go that way as well. Uh, and in fact, when we connect to the ED uh, internal proxy IDP that they have, they do it all with SAML. Oh, okay. So, got it. And that forced reauthorization there, uh, I just saw that there. It says it requires the administrator approval. Is that to work, or you really just couldn't do it <laughs> unless you have approval? Um, that's what they post on their own documentation on uh, on the developers the developer site. I don't know if I can. Is that it? Somewhere buried in here is a, is a thing that says, you know, we've got this option, don't use it unless we give you approval for it though. Because every, it means that every time that someone tries to log in, they have to go through the whole thing again, and that can add a lot. It's, yep, it's money, uh, and it's load on their servers. And for a while, their servers were a little bit on the thin side. I think they've improved it since then though. Thought I saw one more hand up. <laughs> uh, sorry, I wrote all my questions down. Um, the, uh, I saw you were using the, uh, the key module and um, config, uh, which I assume you're like overriding or something in settings.php. You can do it that way, yeah. This is, I was using config here just because it's a demo site. Uh, in our production sites, we stick it in, a, in an environment variable because it's a little more secure. Anything else? All right, thank you very much for coming. It is. <laughs>